I, I'm looking at the words Amra and what he's saying, the, the, the rhetoric versus the fact behind uh, some of the things he's talking about. And truthfully, you know, I was, uh, as a former professional soldier, I wanted to do this professionally. I wanted to take notes. I wanted to conduct an analysis. I'm not a pundit. I'm a military analyst. I'm not worried about ground games or, or delegates. Uh, I wanted to find out what he was going to talk about national security. And within the first five minutes, he had lost me. It was a very confusing speech, not a very well written speech in my view, and I used to be a speech writer in, uh, uh, several decades ago for a four-star general. I was looking for some certain things that discussed national security policy or strategy, and they weren't there. Uh, there, there was a lot of uh, discussion of talking points and the things he said in the past, uh, but no real ends, ways, and means of strategy. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's how I'm going to do it. Here's how we're going to pay for it. Now, of course, uh, a campaign doesn't allow you the time or the attention span of the American audience to go through all those things, but I just got an indicator that it was as painful uh, for him to give the speech as it was for many of us to listen to the speech. He doesn't quite understand uh, some of the things he's talking about. Right, and of course, there were some contradictions there as well that, you know, raise a lot of eyebrows, but this is a man, a presidential candidate who has said in the past that he knows more about ISIS than generals like you. Yeah. Uh, he said that torture works, that he would support waterboarding. He said he would bomb the you-know-what out of ISIS. I'm just curious to know, you know, because obviously you're a retired lieutenant general. Uh, you have a lot of friends in the national security realm. You know people, you know, at the top military brass level. What have those conversations sounded like? Because, again, I spoke with Andrew Kroll, who wrote this in, uh, article about how the U.S. military is preparing for a Trump presidency, and he said that not only are they terrified, but uh, some people he spoke with are preparing to resign. Yeah, I said that uh, once before in, a, in an interview on CNN that I thought it might cause some resignations within the force, and that was nine months ago when he started talking about the requirement for the military to perform, perform waterboarding and other si types of torture that are illegal. I said, as a professional soldier, you would resign before you would carry out an illegal order. And uh, some people didn't take kindly to that, but it's the truth. Uh, it's a professional force. I think there are many people in the upper echelons of the military that are very concerned concerned, not only about uh, some of the things that Mr. Trump has already said he's going to ask the military to do, but more importantly, I think there's an uh, inability for Mr. Trump, uh, at least the way it's been seen, to take advice. You know, you, you talked about my book about leadership. You know, there are some key things in leadership. Character, you know, what a candidate might think and what he, uh, uh, is, what he values and how his character is and how he's empathetic, how he has humility, how he listens to others. and uh, that, then there's also the presence in, in the intellect piece. And truthfully, I think there's a lot of folks in the military that are seeing Mr. Trump uh, not being someone who they can give advice to, but rather someone that they would be very concerned about him firing them. And that falls under the category of toxic leadership. All of those things are in consideration right now with many of the senior military and governmental officials as well. What would you say to the supporters who say, look, you know, I support Trump because he's been such a successful businessman and, you know, that makes him uh, quite qualified to be the leader of the United States, the leader of the free world. Yeah, I, what I would say to them is it's a very different game. Uh, it's a very different requirement and a very different profession to be a statesman, to understand the elements of national security power, uh, to uh, uh, engage with the leaders of the f of different parts of the world, not only your friends but your enemies. And I think some of the things Mr. Trump thinks he can do because he does them in a boardroom, uh, he can't do with other sovereign leaders. You know, these are people who have their own national security worry about and their, all, their own national objectives. Uh, you know, and I, and I think some of the things that, that the Republican candidate is saying is that we will persuade people to do our bidding. Well, yeah, that's that's part of deal making to be sure. But you know, there are other cultures, other languages that like to do things their way too, and don't like to be considered the 51st state of the United States. That mm. I think that's what's concerning to me.